There's a lot to love about Christmas. Um, there's also a reality that we have to uh, face, that Christmas is hard also for a lot of people. And a lot of cases, that, that difficulty with Christmas comes from the fact that the, the festive and happy and cheery atmosphere that we create during the Christmas season doesn't always line up with our reality. Like, when I'm having a bad day, hearing um, the excessive, pentaton- excessive peppiness of a Pentatonix album, a uh, Christmas album blaring at me from every direction, it doesn't lift my spirits. It's, it's just kind of insulting, you know? And uh, the, the reality is my, my family loves it. Uh, they love that kind of stuff. Um, but I have to die to myself, and uh, they can know that truly in my heart, I do die a little every time I hear it. But, but for a lot of people, the, the dissonance between... The, the festive and happiness of the Christmas season and, and their own reality, it, it does go differ, deeper than that. Especially when it comes to this word, peace. We decorate our homes with the word peace and we sing songs about peace, but for as long as I have been on this earth, there hasn't really been a Christmas when there has been complete peace on earth. There are a lot of different ways in which there is, there is not peace. Um, I find it really interesting that at the end of the Vietnam War, on April 30th, 1975, when the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong made their final push to cap- capture the, si- the city of Saigon, and the Americans began to evacuate, all the radios in the city began playing Bing Crosby's song, I'm Dreaming of a White Christmas. Now this was a signal for them to evacuate, and... It kind of seems like, you know, you can't possibly imagine a more inappropriate soundtrack for the violence and the panic that people were feeling on that day in the city. But then again, every Christmas we sing about peace, and there's still violence and panic and sorrow and destruction in our world. Every Christmas there is a worldwide deficiency of peace. So how inappropriate is it, really? You know, back uh, 18 years ago, which in the year 2000, can you believe the year 2000 was 18 years ago? Um, you too released a song called Peace on Earth. And it, and it gives voice to this, this dissonance that we feel um, when we sing about peace on earth and yet there isn't peace on earth. It goes like this, heaven on earth, we need it now. I'm sick of all this hanging around, sick of sorrow, sick of pain, sick of hearing again and again that there's going to be peace on earth. Jesus, can you take the time to throw a drowning man a line? Peace on earth. Tell the ones who hear no sound, whose sons are living in the ground, peace on earth. No who's or why's, no one cries, like a mother cries for peace on earth. She never got to say goodbye, to see the color in his eyes. And now he's in the dirt. Peace on earth. Jesus, in the song you wrote, the words are sticking in my throat. Peace on earth. I hear it every Christmas time. But hope and history won't rhyme. So what's it worth, this peace on earth? We have hope for peace. We talk about peace. But history doesn't seem to bring it out. It seem, doesn't seem to be happening, and I think the world needs an answer from Christians, from people who follow Jesus, why it is that we, we do sing about peace on earth at Christmas. Maybe in your own life right now, you need a reason to celebrate peace on earth because you're just not seeing it in your circumstances. You're not seeing it in your life yet. Now, we should sing about peace on earth, but we do need to know why. We do need to know why we're singing it. We need to be able to explain to people why the army of angels, who were maybe not quite as cute as this, why they were singing to the shepherds on that night when they met them in the field, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to to those with whom God is pleased. So why sing about peace when hope and history don't match up? For that, we're going to look at 
a passage that isn't really a traditional Christmas passage. It doesn't talk about how Jesus came into the world, how he was born. The kids already did that for us. But it does tell us why. It tells us what he came to do. So let's look at Colossians. And we'll look at chapter 1, verse 19. Colossians 1, 19 says, For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated, him by your, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence, and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. Why do we celebrate peace at Christmas? Because we needed reconciliation with God, and Jesus came to reconcile us. He came to bring us peace. He came to bring this world peace. A world that had no chance of making peace with either itself or its creator. So I want to unpack this morning what that means. First, we'll look at our need for peace, and then the way to peace, and finally, what is the effect of peace? What does peace actually do? So first, let's talk about our need for peace. In the beginning, there was peace. There was no conflict between mankind and nature. When God made everything, it was good. And then when he made humanity, when he made male and female, he said, this is very good. And there was harmony. There was harmony with us in the natural world. There wasn't a struggle to survive. In the beginning, there was peace between people. There was no war, even though there was marriage. See, God created Adam. And then the first mention in the book of Genesis of anything ever being not good was that he said it's not good for man to be alone. And so it says that he formed Eve from Adam's side. Now, a lot of translations here use this word rib, and uh, that's a stumbling point for a lot of people because they're like, he made Eve from a rib? That, that's weird, right? Does anyone else find that weird? One pastor said, can't you see that this is beautiful? This is poetic, right? What, what this is, God took the spare rib and he made it the prime rib. It's poetry, It is, it is beautifully poetic, actually. See, this word rib, it's a word that's not translated rib anywhere else in the Bible. It's, it's a word that kind of, it's like the word you'd use to describe the side of a room. Made it from Adam's, he made Eve from Adam's side. And what, so what is this imagery, what is this poetry pointing to? It's saying something important about the relationship between men and women. The fact that God forms Eve from Adam's side shows first that she is neither higher nor lower uh, as a form of life. They are equal in value. But not only that, God made Eve to be beside Adam and Adam to be beside Eve. They are made to complement one another. They're made to be companions and to have intimacy and friendship with one another. In the beginning, there was marriage, but there was no struggle for power. There wasn't hidden agendas. There wasn't passive aggressiveness. There wasn't conflict over socks left on the floor because there were no socks or clothes of any kind at all. They were completely naked and unashamed. And this should tell us something else important about the peace they enjoyed. Because they were at peace with themselves. And this peace that allowed them to be completely unashamed came from the fact that they were at peace with their creator. They had the kind of relationship with with their creator where they could just walk with him. They could talk to him. There was no shame. There was no guilt. There was no hiddenness. Peace with him also meant there was no crying, no mourning, no pain, no sickness, no death. That is, until that peace was broken. And they went from having a a peaceful relationship with their creator 
to having an unreconciled relationship with their creator. That's what sin does. And that unreconciled relationship with their creator led to a lack of peace in every other area of their lives. They felt naked and they had to cover themselves because who they had become was different than they knew they should be. So they tried to hide. They're ashamed. And life then became a struggle. It became a struggle for survival because they're no longer at peace with nature. They have to fight to protect themselves. They have to to work the land in order for it to sustain them. And they don't even have peace in their own family anymore. Adam and Eve had sons. One of those sons was murdered. The other son, a murderer. That's the pain they had to feel from their lack of peace in their lives. The situation our world is in, we are in, of always needing peace, but never being able to find it, never being able to create peace on our own, it all points back to this, having an unreconciled relationship to our Creator. So how can we be reconciled? How can we know peace? Paul says in, in Colossians 1.22 that peace comes from being fit to stand in God's presence. I want to look at verse 22 again, and this time we're going to look at a different translation, one that's a little bit more word for word, because there's something important I want to draw out here. So we'll look at Colossians 1.22. This is the New English translation. Paul says, but now Jesus has reconciled you by his physical body through death to present you holy without blemish and blameless before him. I want us to focus on this language of being without blemish. It seems very strange to us. It's like, okay, I have a little bit of acne, but what does that have to do with me being fit to stand before God? Um, But this taps into language from the Old Testament. It comes from the Old Testament laws about how people can meet with God and have fellowship with God in the temple or the tabernacle. So in the Old Testament, God was already creating a plan for reconciling us, and he was creating these systems by which people would come and meet with him and experience his presence. And the way this happens is that you would go to the tabernacle or the temple. And in order to be able to do that, you had to be physically clean. And you would have to present a sacrifice, one that is without blemish and also completely clean. And the key words that that accompany everything to do with the temple and, and all the rituals are words like without blemish, without fault, and clean. And the, book of Leviticus, the books of Leviticus and Numbers give us all these laws. They describe in minute detail all the steps that you had to go through to make yourself clean and all the things that you had to avoid in order to remain clean. Your, first of all, your body had to be completely clean, but then also your clothes had to be free of soil or, or stains. You couldn't go to the temple if you were sick or if you were injured in any way. You couldn't have been in contact with someone who was sick. You couldn't have touched a dead body. You couldn't have eaten unkosher foods. You couldn't have even touched them. And you, as you went about your life, you were constantly bombarded with all these different situations where you could potentially become ritually unclean. And so you had to protect yourself from contamination. And these laws, they seem totally bizarre to us now because we think that's not how we relate to God. But they do point to something important, something deeper. And that's that human beings are spiritually unclean and we need to be made clean. We are made to be holy as he is holy. But our sin makes us unfit for God's presence. We don't think of God like that. But that's because we don't really think about that word holiness enough. To be holy is to be set apart. But this isn't a concept that is some relic of some ancient obsolete religion. 
Holiness at its heart is also about justice, and it is about having peace. The same kind of justice and peace that we know we need, that we long for, that we strive for, even in our own society. Tim Keller gives gives a really good explanation of it. He explains it this way. He says, what's the purpose of human laws? To have peace with one another. What is the content of human laws? They demand that we treat other human beings as nothing less than what they are. If we trample upon them and treat them as less than what they are, there is no peace. The law says we have to treat people with dignity as fellow human beings. So what are the consequences of breaking the law? Well, if someone breaks into your house and ransacks the place and goes before the judge and says, I'm sorry, what's the judge going to say? What is the community going to say? They're going to say not good enough. You're in an unreconciled relationship with not only your victim, but with justice itself. There's a cost to be paid, and until it's paid, you don't get to enjoy the full privileges of citizenship. That's what prison is. In a prison, a person is cut off from society until they've paid their debt. Okay, that's human law. What's divine law? Divine law, why? For peace and for fellowship. We have divine law so that we can live with him. What is the content of divine law? It's to treat God as nothing less than he is, which is to love him with all your heart and soul and all your mind. What are the consequences of breaking the law? Well, when you decide to live as your own king, you're treating him as less than who, than what he is. The law isn't about rules and regulations. It's about trading, treating him as he deserves to be treated. And when you treat him as less than who he is, you can't just say, meh. And you can't just say, sorry. But this isn't like a debt you incur when you trample on your neighbors and you, and you break the laws of your community. If God is an infinite God, and he's given you and he's created you and given you everything you have, and then you are in an unreconciled relationship, your debt is an infinite debt that you can't possibly pay. So the question is, then is this, if we owe a debt we can't possibly pay, how can there ever be peace? The way to peace. See, in order for For peace to happen, God has to make it happen. It has to come from his side. In the tabernacle or the temple, the way that you did this, the way that you you approached God was you had to be completely clean and you had to bring an animal sacrifice, an animal without blemish, one that was without spot. And, And in Leviticus 1, Moses explains why. He says in Leviticus 1 verse 2, when you present an animal as an offering to the Lord, it must be a male with no defects. Bring it to the entrance of the temple so that you may be accepted by the Lord. Lay your hand on the animal's head and the Lord will accept its death in your place to purify you so that you may be right with him. See, when you lay your hand on the animal, it represents you. The animal had to be without blemish and without fault because in the act of sacrifice, in the act of putting your hand on it, what's, what's happening is you are transferring your sinfulness onto the animal. And the animal is transferring its sinlessness, its blemishlessness to you. According to the Old Testament law, this is how a person could be made fit to stand in the presence of God by having their sin removed. So did it work? No. But it was a sign pointing forward to something that did. A single sacrifice that did remove our sin. And this is what Paul says in Colossians 1. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through, him, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of 
Christ's blood on the cross. It was never an animal's blood that took away a person's sin. It was and still is always and only Christ's blood that can take away our sin. That's what pays that debt we can never pay on our own. And so when we put our faith in Christ, what we are doing is we are spiritually laying our hands on him so that our sins become his. And his sinlessness becomes ours. In Mark chapter 5, we read about a woman who had suffered from some sort of hemorrhage, some kind of internal bleeding for 12 years. And she heard Jesus was nearby, and so she went to, to Jesus to be healed. It's hard to imagine the kind of physical suffering that she would have had, put, had to put up with for 12 years. It's hard to imagine the, the, the social stigma that she faced as a woman with, with that kind of an issue in a culture that really didn't have any medical or, or sanitary way of dealing with that. But there's also a spiritual dimension to this that a lot of us don't really think about. See, with, with that kind of a condition, she could not have been admitted into the temple because she was, she was ritually unclean. She was cut off from the presence of God for 12 years. She was not fit to stand in his presence. We don't know how she knew what she knew about Jesus, but it is clear that she knew something no one else knew. Mark 5 says, She heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd and she touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. And immediately the, the bleeding stopped. And she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Mark says that Jesus immediately, he, he felt that power had gone out from him. And he says, who touched me? And the, the disciples, they think this is a completely ridiculous question because he's being pressed on every side by this mob of people. And they're like, how can you possibly ask who's touching you? Everybody's touching you. But only one person came to touch him in faith. He calls out to her and he says, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace, your suffering is over. So what happened here? Through faith, his his wholeness, his blemishlessness was transferred to her and she was healed. But not only that, her brokenness and her bleeding would become his brokenness and his bleeding. Not right that second, but at the cross, that's what happened. And at Christmas, as we celebrate the coming of the Messiah, as we celebrate the, the arrival of this baby, this is what he came to do. This is what the Messiah came to do. Isaiah 53 says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. So how is peace with God made? It's when he He takes our unfitness and our brokenness on himself. And his wholeness and his righteousness are given to us. This is how God pays the debt we could never pay. That's how peace happens. So what is the effect? The effects of this are both personal and they are world-changing. Uh, if you have a Bible, open it to Hebrews 10 for a second here. Hebrews 10, 11 to 14 says, 
Under the old covenant, a priest stands and ministers before the altar, day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away sins. But our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. And then he sat down at the place of honor at God's right hand. There he waits until his enemies are humbled and made a footstool under his feet. For by that one offering, he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. So the personal effect of this is that we are made completely presentable before God. We are made holy as he is holy. We are blameless as he is blameless. We have been made perfect as he is perfect. We are completely reconciled to God. See, when God looks at you, he doesn't see your rebellion. He doesn't see your selfishness. He doesn't see your greed. He doesn't see your hatred. He doesn't see your disobedience. What he sees is beautiful. When you're forgiven... The sight of you in the eyes of God brings him tremendous joy like you can't possibly imagine. But it's good to try. <laughs> it's good to try to imagine. I mean, we, we do get these glimpses of that kind of joy sometimes in life, right? Like I remember um, my wedding day, seeing my wife come down, my bride come down the aisle and just thinking, Wow. I get to share my reality for the rest of my life with this woman. I remember seeing each of my kids for the first time and thinking, wow, like, this is someone who I am, like, bound to for the rest of my life, and, you know, Lord willing, they will all be there uh, as I'm laying on my deathbed. Like, we're, we're just bound together. See, when God made us, he made us for eternity with him. The thought of eternity with you and me brings him joy. And, and that's hard to imagine because sometimes I'm like, for me, the thought of eternity with me doesn't bring me that much joy. But for him, it does. He made us and said, it is very good. He loves what he made. But the peace that he, he brings us, it's not just personal, it is also world-changing. The book of Hebrews tells us that after Jesus offered his body as a sacrifice for our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the Father, and he's waiting until his enemies are humbled and made a footstool under his feet. What's this saying? It's saying that he's not done, brothers and sisters. He has an agenda, he has power, and he's coming back. He has all authority to direct history toward its final and complete defeat of evil so that we can know complete peace in every area of our lives. Satan will be defeated. The powers of darkness will be defeated. The last enemy to be destroyed is death itself and the created universe will be at complete peace. One of the, my favorite lines in that song we sang Joy to the world is he comes to make his blessings known as far as the curse is found. Just think about that for a second. In every area of life that that curse has brought you pain, every area, he comes to bring peace. There won't be war anymore. Because Jesus will reign over everything. Life won't be a struggle for survival. Because we will live in a new creation that's not plagued, not cursed by sin and death. No more crying, no more pain, no more shame. We sing about peace at Christmas time because Jesus has come to bring us to peace with God. And once, peace, we, have, once we have peace with God, once we are reconciled to him, Peace with everything else must follow. Let's pray.
Father, there are many reasons um, why we can feel discouraged or hurt or sad at Christmas time, and yet we, we do celebrate. We celebrate that you have reconciled us to God. We celebrate that we have peace with you. And we know that final and complete peace is coming. So for all those who hurt, I pray that we would be filled with hope. For all those who sing, I pray that we would sing and bear witness to that that light has come into the world and the darkness has not overcome it. And it never will. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we sing, I don't want to invite Darcy up because we have something exciting happening today. The mic is right there. Darcy, the floor is yours. Hi. Um, yeah, kind of nervous and excited at the same time, but um, there's, uh, there's someone that I've known in this town for a while and kind of known their family and I've been able to get to know them a little bit more over the last couple of years and I got to see uh, a change and hear the change and I was approached uh, about them wanting to be baptized by them wanting to uh, make the acknowledgement uh, for a symbol of their faith and to grow in a deeper relationship with Christ and uh, I felt honored uh, that she had come to me with this um, but before that there's just something in this little handout we were given that really kind of stuck out to me and just just a couple sentences and I'm going to invite her up to kind of share her story but um, as Christians, we have become part of a new kingdom. We do not gain entry to this kingdom of Jesus Christ through birth, rather through faith, through the heart rather than a physical association or a physical act. And I don't know, it just kind of stunned, it stuck out for me because it's uh, knowing this person and knowing their heart um, and seeing how much they care and want to serve and love other people and wanting to do this. It's just a mature decision. It's a, it's a good decision especially when you're leading a family and, and uh, friends around you. So I guess on that, I would just like to invite up uh, Tina McDonald to share. kids who I love so much and um, originally from Kingston, Ontario and uh, came from a Catholic family. I was fortunate to meet my future husband at the age of 15. Um, um, my parents were going through a divorce so I decided to be, uh, be a rebel and Shane's, my husband's um, parents kind of got me into um, being a Christian, and it takes patience, what my dad always told me. Tina, have patience. I don't have patience. Um, today, um, I have patience, and I'm seeing the light, and I'm very blessed to have Darcy be there with me today. And I thank this church for everyone being here. John Calvin will be with me today. And, um, I'm just blessed. I just feel really happy and lots of joy. <laughs> well, um, just join me as I pray for Tina. Um, actually, before all that, we're not going to go down to the river because it's it's cold. <laughs> I look like I might be of Scandinavian descent. I don't think so. I like hot, warm, temperate water, waters and weather a little bit more. So what we'll be doing at Tina's house in her hot tub with uh, her family and uh, a few friends. Um, so I just invite you now to pray with me here. And um, yeah, thank you. Um, Father God, I just want to thank you so much for how you work in our lives and how the journey is never one day, but it's, it's a time, it's a period. And you take us through peaks and valleys and you lead us to this point to make a decision. I thank you for Tina and her friendship. 
I thank you for her heart. I thank you for her family, God. And I pray, I pray that, that your spirit just continues to grow in, in wisdom and knowledge in her head and in her heart, and that she can lead and live in your light, Lord. That she can be a lampstand in this town here, Lord, and in her family and amongst her friends, God. So we just invite you to be a part of this, be with us, continue just to, to bless and nourish uh, her on this journey. So we thank you and love you in Jesus' name. Amen. So yeah, thank you for being here. This is cool. Shane, thanks for letting us do this at your house. And uh, yeah, um, Tina, I'm honored to do this, and, and um, this is awesome. So uh, there's one thing that kind of I read in that paper that makes sense, and one question or one statement that is, you can say yes or no, but yeah, we don't know the answer. But do you renounce the devil and all he stands for? Yes. Yes. <laughs> and um, you have accepted Christ into your heart, and this is a symbol of you walking in faith in a relationship with him. So I think probably the best thing now is I'll dunk you under, and we'll come up. And there's a little cool thing I thought is everyone says alive in Christ when you go when you come up. So let's uh, so yeah I guess the next step is you go under and then come back up. So okay. let's do this. All right, mm -hmm. all right, ready? One, two, three. And down and up. Alive in Christ. Come on, guys. It's the Anyway, alive in Christ. Yeah.